Good morning. Well, as we've been walking and going through the gospel mark with each other, we have seen that Jesus in his timeline has now been about three years working with his disciples. They've spent almost every waking moment watching Jesus. They've been listening to his instructions. Yet, as we have seen, they still have and had many weaknesses. As we investigate the smudges on the mirror, we see in ourselves the same weaknesses and struggles that they struggled with. We're looking at a passage here this morning that is going to be enormously helpful for us as a church and as individuals. And at first glance, when we look into it, it looks like an assortment of sayings about all different topics jumbled in one conversation, infighting, children, exclusion, temptation. These conversations take place in different settings on their journey of following Christ. As the disciples pass through Galilee, Capernaum, Jesus will eventually lead them to, and us, to Jerusalem and ultimately the cross. As we cover a large section of scripture here this morning, it shines the spotlight on us. It identifies with us as we are, reveals what is wrong with us, identifies the sin underneath the sin, and it brings us a solution. It brings us to the solution. It gives us a picture of what the results could be like. Well, if you have your gospel, or gospel, yes, if you have your Bible with you, please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. And we're going to look at a big chunk of scripture here, verses 30 to 50. And I'm just going to jump right in and read that to us here this morning. And then I'll open in a word of prayer. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 30. They went on, their, on from there and passed through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying, and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all, and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able, will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who, believes, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable quenchable fire. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter, lame, enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. 
where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. There's a lot in here, and so we'll get to it shortly. Let's pray as we start here this morning. Heavenly Father, our magnificent God and Creator, how we thank you, and how can we ever thank you or repay you for your grace and kindness towards us. But Father, as we have read this section of Scripture here in Mark, may you help us to understand all that you have spoken to us as we dig into it here and, and apply our lives to it this morning. Father, may you help us to serve others with grace. May you give us eyes to see others as you do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when the Father affirmed the Son on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, likely Mount Haram, uh, he told the three disciples to listen to him. In the text before us here, they were given plenty of opportunity to do so. The message of Mark chapter 9 verses 30 to 50 is the cross of the Lord Jesus, is that the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ should cast a very long shadow over our lives. The question we need to ask ourselves or questions we need to ask ourselves is how much does the cross of Jesus affect our lives? And is it constantly in the forefront? Does it influence the way that you live, how you treat one another, and how you spend your time? Ultimately, the cross of Jesus is to dominate every area in our lives. Well, Paul emphasizes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, and then again in, over in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. The Christian, in other words, is called to live a cross-centered life. Jesus has already spent his time telling his disciples this back in, in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38, and continues to drive home the point. When we lose sight of Christ, the gospel of Christ, when we lose sight of his work on the cross, we are bound to make a mess of our discipleship, which brings us back to Jesus' teaching in verses 30 to 32. Verse 30, in beginning of, of verse 31, says that they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples. What is Jesus teaching about here? Well, the same thing that he was teaching back in chapter 8, from all the way to the beginning of chapter 9, what it meant for him to be the Messiah, and what it means for them to be his disciples. This becomes Jesus' focus after the disciples confess that Jesus is the Messiah. Before Jesus wanted to be alone to get away from the crowds, well here now he wants to be alone with them to teach them. Just as in chapter 8 he explained that the, what the Messiah must do and Jesus does so once again. Verse 31 finishes off saying, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. What Jesus is explaining here is the gospel on how he will die for their sins, our sins, others, and then rise to life. 
Verse 32 says, But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. The disciples don't have a category of suffering in their thinking for the Messiah. Instead of asking Jesus for clarification here, they seem content to ignore or at least minimize his announcements, focusing instead on his promise of the kingdom. Peter's learned his lesson here. <laughs> uh, it's taken him a few times. We see that later on. Um, not to argue with Jesus about the subject. And so he and the other disciples take the next preferred tactic. Keep quiet and hope that Jesus drops the subject. Right? <laughs> we, we tend to do that in our own lives. Well, as believers, we can go to the scriptures and make much of the promises of God and at the very same time pay little attention to the hard teachings and commands of Jesus. As we go from Jesus' teaching of his death and resurrection, there's a jarring transition here in our Bibles. We go from Jesus walking toward the cross to hearing the disciples debate about well, who will be the greatest in the kingdom? Verse 33, 34 says, And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Well, we can see from reading this, we can see the foolishness in the disciples' conversation about greatness. Uh, the debate is a natural outworking of their worldview. Uh, basically, like us, we can see ourselves in a mirror here with the disciples. They're self-absorbed. And we all have that desire, don't we? For the flashlight to be shone on us. We can look and think of all kinds of opportunities. <laughs> uh, Areas where that has been done in our lives. This past week, the spotlight got shone on me for a moment. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it quickly disappeared when I wasn't a household name. And that's okay with me. But while talking with some of the teachers at Noah's outdoor um, school day, fun day at Jim Smith Lake, the question came up from one lady who entered the conversation in a little bit later, but it was almost a demand. <laughs> she, she asked, what's your name? Who are you? All the eyes now on me explaining that I was a pastor serving here at Marysville Community Church. It didn't make any connection in her mind and so she quickly changed the subject but many times though in our world in our in our different daily live act lives activities we crave the status of the spotlight and approval of others we we desperately want to be on top even at the expense of others now, like the disciples, their expect, expectations and desires for greatness leave them blind to anything that Jesus says about humility and suffering. In a similar way, we can be guilty of that, by, of hearing what Jesus says and yet still be thinking and living based on what we have previously believed to be true. Verse 35 says, And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And once again, we see, see Jesus turning our way of thinking on its head. Here is what Jesus is saying. If you want to be highly regarded by God, you must concentrate on being a good servant to others, not for getting ahead of others. Jesus is our example. We see that in Philippians chapter 2. Jesus didn't serve out of fear or guilt, but out of joy, not out of cowardice or corrosion, but out of courage 
and desire. The next step, and, and words hit us profound and yet hit us as profound and yet are also perplexing. After, defi after defining the path of greatness as, a humble, as humble servanthood, Jesus picks up a child and offers them and us a parable. Verse 36 says, He took a child and put him in the midst of them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one, should, one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. When Jesus speaks of receiving, he's using a term of hospitality. It's the idea of welcoming someone in, showing kindness for another person. And as Jesus holds that child in his arms, he says, if you receive them, you receive me and the one who sent me. The way we show our love for Jesus and the way that we honor him by loving is by loving, serving, honoring the lowly and the needy around us. That's a great lesson to remember, right? Well, we see here that John changes the topic. Verse 38, John said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he's not following us. Well, the real issue now comes out here, comes to light. The spotlight's on it. The concern has the appearance of being a noble one, but it's hiding something more sinister. The man was a blow to their identity. It undermined their special status. They had just failed to cast out a demon shortly before this. And here was this man who wasn't even one of them casting out demons and apparently had success. They weren't happy. But it wasn't primarily out of concern for Jesus. It was, it was out of their own insecurity. In the church, it's not uncommon to find two kinds of people. Those who are passionate about, passionate about unity and those that are passionate about truth. They don't need to be exclusive, but often we are pulled to one side or the other. As we come to verses 38 to 41, we find Jesus helping the disciples to recognize the danger of exclusively, ex exclusivity over unity. No doubt driven in part by pride here, the disciples are quick to protect the name of Jesus, to stand against anyone who they perceived as unqualified, as an unqualified disciple. There's a couple of references of, of what John is getting at. Uh, Luke records for us in Acts chapter 19, verses 13 to 16. And it talks about the seven sons of Skevia, a Jewish chief priest who was trying to exercise demons using Jesus' name. In his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. We see that in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 to 23. But here, Jesus strangely, strangely shows little concern. Verse 39 to 41 says, But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Why the change of attitude here? Why does he in one instance condemn people who use his name to carry out actual miracles and and yet are not real followers and then 
what an actual person is presented to him who, who uses his name but doesn't fall doesn't follow him. He rebukes his disciples after disciples rather than this man. Kind of at first glance doesn't make sense. But the reason is that the real issue involves the disciples' concern for their own status. This man is not one of us. The word us. We are the chosen ones, not him. And embarrassingly enough, this man is effective in something that they could not claim just a little while before. If the disciples are acting on their own authority, they will fail. But if they truly are of God, then the leaders will find themselves fighting against God. The same reasoning is here. If this man is actually truly for Jesus, then he's for Jesus, not against him. So what if he has gone through, so what if he hasn't gone through the same validation process as the disciples? Not everyone can follow Jesus in the same manner as the disciples, nor must Jesus ordain everyone like he did with the disciples. Let the Holy Spirit work as he pleases. If man is not a true believer, he will get his due at the proper time. This has gotten me many times. There's lots of conversations, and this right there has helped me see what God is after. But then, vice versa. If the opposite is, occurs, Jesus is saying, if someone, whether though he is malicious or indifference, leads this child away who believes in me, well, that person may as well go ahead and perform his own execution according to verse 43. We don't even have to look at all that. It says it plainly. To follow Jesus is a high calling. It's a costly calling. But for those who reject him and remain in their sin, the cost is much higher. Which, by the way, leads Jesus to another thought. The danger of treating sin in our lives lightly. Verses 43 to 48 says, And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Three times, Jesus calls for radical efforts to avoid sin because the consequences of sin is hell. Right in here, Isaiah 66, verse 24, sheds light on the consequences of rebelling against God. You may have noticed in your Bibles, two verses missing in your text. Maybe you haven't. You just kind of followed along, didn't really look at the number there. Verses 44 and 46 are missing in your Bibles. They're a repeat of verse 48, which again goes back to Isaiah 66, Verse 24. No one in scriptures teaches more about hell than Jesus. While Jesus is, here is not literally calling for self-mutilation, the point is clear. Those who remain in their sins will go to hell. This is the unquenchable fire that he's talking about. It lasts for eternity. 
It's a vivid reminder for us to change our path. He's calling us to examine our own lives, the practice of radical surgery on ourselves, to do whatever we need to do to protect ourselves from sin. And the question we need to ask is a pretty important one. Are we right with God? Have we grasped the gospel, the cross? Back in Mark 8, Jesus predicts his own suffering. He corrects a mistake in the disciples, and then he clarifies what it means to follow him in light of his suffering. In other words, the fundamental issue here is a failure to understand that we serve a Savior who went to the cross and who invites us to follow him and suffer. That's, that's probably news to some of us. We see the opposite in the news and TV from the example of our governments, even how we conduct our own lives. And unfortunately, it has entered the church. There seems to be a lot of reflection on how to avoid suffering and on what we do, what we can do when we hurt. We have a lot of teaching about how to escape from and therapy for suffering, but there is an inadequate teaching about the theology of suffering. Christians are either not taught or they've turned a blind eye that we should expect suffering as Christians. And why suffering is so important for healthy growth as a Christian. Do you know why the disciples were struggling so hard with all these problems? It was because they hadn't yet grasped what Jesus was going to do. They thought that Jesus was a victorious conqueror. They had no category for their Messiah who would suffer and be killed. The fundamental problem is that the disciples failed to grasp the way to the cross as the only path Jesus would take. But the path that they were called to take as well. And it is with us too. The main problem then in the Christian life is that we have not thought out the deep implications of the gospel. We have not used the gospel in all, gospel in and on all parts of our lives. When we understand the cross, we will be transformed in these areas. Verses 49 to 50 finish out our passage and Jesus train of thought here, which says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Big question. Are you salty? <laughs> has God's has salt penetrated your fiber so that you're distinguished from your former self and from the people of the world? The work of the Word and of the Spirit produces godly character, enabling a person to act as a preservative in society. The salt is more than being a good moral person. It involves living a radical life, a life categorized by service to others, a life that embraces everyone who lives under the same name of Jesus. A life that op opposes the evil seduction of sin. It's a life that doesn't make sense to those who do not belong to Jesus. A life that is to be pitied if indeed Christ has not risen from the dead. 
Jesus tells his disciples and us, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Be at peace in the family of God. Don't worry about getting recognition. Rather, be concerned with how you might serve others. Give attention to your own heart so that you might be seasoned with the very salt of Jesus. The, Jesus, the Jews had a saying, the world cannot survive without salt. And neither can the church. And that was Jesus' point. We live, if we live in the shadow of the cross, if we live in his value value system rather than bickering and and battling and belittling one another we will rather be bettering perfecting one another we will build we will be building one another up peaceful harmony will result rather than hostility in all these things we become a source of good in the church which makes us the church a source for good in the world. This is a helpful word, encouraging word for the church and us today. If we're going to be the kind of disciples and witnesses that God has called us to be, we must live in unity with one another. We must live together in a way that shows the world the power of the gospel. And when that happens, we will be a community of people transformed by the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise of eternal life through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I know that without your mercy, without your power, without your grace, I, we, would continue to fail and be without hope. We thank you for the warnings of life, of living a life apart from you and our sin. Help us to live a life that glorifies you, to, to understand what your son did on the cross for us. Help us to come, overcome our self-absorbedness, our insecurities, our temptations to sin. Father, may you help us to rely on you and not ourselves and our own strengths. And may we rely on your mercy, your grace, your strength, your direction, your will. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.